Good afternoon, everyone. Like Bill said, my name is Nang Kong. I'm the interim head of biomedical engineering. Uh, being the last, I get to congratulate the two previous presenters. A job well done. And it's my great honor to introduce a good colleague of mine and a personal friend of mine, Dr. Yinjie Tong. Uh, Yinjie came to the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering in 2017 um, from Harvard, Harvard Medical School, where he was a assistant professor. Uh, Yunjie is an outstanding MRI researcher, teacher, and globally minded faculty member in the school and leader in the imaging area. MRI, for those of you who don't know what that is, and you see the scanner um, everywhere in a hospital, and you would uh, lie still and get transported just through the tunnel, and that's really where Yunjie, uh, Yunjie's contribution is justified. And because what he does is when you're in motion and you're in naturalistic environment and how to make sure the MIR scanners can still really um, get, um, get the images correctly. So uh, Yunjie is a pioneer recognized by his peers in understanding the spontaneous hemodynamic low frequency oscillation in the human brain and body, and has developed innovative application that the functional MRI research community appreciates and adopts the, uh, to uh, adopt. And more broadly, Yunjie's uh, prime, primary research impact improved the quality of MRI imaging by considering normal human physiology. Um, like I said, Yunjie is not just a dear colleague, he's really a personal friend. And um, he graduated from uh, Peking University of Physics, and we say in uh, um, Harvard and Yale in China, and uh, Tsinghua and uh, Peking University, and I graduated from Tsinghua. And we often say that's the other school down the road. Um, and also, um, Yunjie has produced a wonderful uh, son, and son um, worked with me um, on a e-health software and development project for a few years. Now he's at uh, uh, Columbia uh, Computer Science. So perhaps now if you bump into Yunjie in a grocery store and he's not gonna be introduced by Dr. Yunjie Tong, is Kyle, his son, Kyle's father. So without further ado, let me pass it to uh, Dr. Tong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I can Everybody can hear me? Okay. So I'll talk to uh, you about my journey, which is quite different from <laughs> the previous two professors. Um, let me start with, so I was born in Shanghai, China, and I was raised up in Beijing. So this is the view from my parents' apartment. And you can see that Tiananmen Square is lined between these two buildings, it's somewhere here. So it's about 10, I'll say like six miles from my uh, apartment. And uh, I um, went to Peking University. Uh, I graduated there uh, in majoring in physics. And, uh, but uh, let me tell you, I was a bad student. Mm -hmm. So I remember me and uh, my best friend, we went to the lecture, and we spent five minutes trying to understand what professor said. Then we totally, he lost us in five minutes, then we start taking a long nap. So, um, you know, I wasn't a very good student there. Uh, I tried, but I wasn't a very good student there. Um, I graduate uh, in, uh, uh, after I graduate, I come to United States. I first enrolled in a, a BU physics department, and then later on I bumped into, uh, you know, uh, Tufts, uh, biomedical engineering. So I basically spent more than 10 years in grad school. So I was bouncing between projects, not being successful, and you can tell, and uh, I was uh, bouncing, bouncing between different uh, faculties. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of struggle uh, in doing research, I realized I, you know, now I didn't really know how to do research at the very beginning. So actually that became my asset. So because now I talk to my graduate student, I can tell them I've been there. So whatever problem you had, I had that before. So during the, those 10 years, you know, I've been bumping into many, many problems. You know, some are my problems, some, you know, my uh, you know, research problems, some are my mentor's problems. But anyway, so it was a long journey. So I was pretty depressed during that time. You can tell, right? So there's a two things actually helped me to survive those years. One is my family, it's my friend, my wife, and the second one is, uh, is running. So I developed uh, a hobby which is run. So basically, you can see this is Charles River, 
So I, I sometimes I run very, very long miles just to uh, calm myself down, right? So it, it wasn't very easy years, but I was managed to, uh, to, uh, to graduate. So, um, in two, you know, so I graduated with a, a PhD degree in biomedical engineering, right? And um, so at that time, I said, I'm done with research. Now, like you guys, you know, I, was, I said, I'm done with research. I want to get out of this. So, but that was in year 2008. Uh, everybody know that 2008 we have a collapse in economy, right? So I couldn't find a job. So at that time, actually, one person who changed my life. Uh, his name is Blaise uh, Frederick. He's a, um, a Harvard professor, and we used to collaborate on uh, imaging studies when I was a graduate student. So he came to me just by random chances. He came to me and said, Yunji, I, I just got R21. I need a postdoc to work on this. I was like, I have nowhere to go. Right. I said, oh, yeah, I'll spend two years with you in, uh, in Harvard Medical School, and uh, then I'll just go find a job. So actually, that changed me quite a bit. Right? I'll tell you later. So basically, this is uh, where McLean Hospital is located. I don't know if you know McLean Hospital, which is, belongs to Harvard, you know, Department of Psychiatry, Harvard Medical School. And this is the best private uh, psychiatry hospital in the United States. Right? So I, was, uh, you know, I planned to stay there for two years, work with Blaze. And then I would just leave. But actually, it turned out to be many more years. So I spent many more years in a psychiatric hospital doing brain research. And um, in 2017, you know, that was me. So I decided to uh, uh, come to Purdue. There's a several reasons for me to make that decision. The number one is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit later, that my research actually during the years I spent in uh, McLean Hospital, actually my research gradually shifted from you know, human brain function to human brain physiology. Then you know that this, you know, the McLean Hospital is a psychiatric hospital. So people there are not very interested in the physiology. They're interested in brain function, right? So that's one reason I want to, you know, move out because I really like physiology. Uh, the second reason is I was uh, tried, you know, me and Blaise, Dr. Frederick, we both, you know, graduate with our engineering degrees, with our physics degrees. Then we feel like we're not, like, speak to the, right? You know, it's not like, People are not right people, but it's not speaking with your peers, right? You talk with a lot of psychiatrists, you talk with a lot of, uh, um, so it, we feel like, I feel like, you know, I really want to, you know, work amongst engineers. Uh, then, you know, at that time, you know, uh, Purdue has this opening, so I was interviewed, you know, I got a job, I came here 2017, January 1st, right? So that's all the way, we drove all the way. This is my son hiding behind me, you know, when I came here. Um, So I just want to, uh, you know, I know this is not a research talk, right? I just want to briefly talk about the experiment which changed my life, right? So when I was in grad school in Tufts uh, Biomedical Engineering, I was doing a functional near infrared spectroscopy. Basically, this is non-invasive optical imaging device. So, you know, you can see you have optodes, you know, some sources, some are detectors. So these are, people are aware of this, you know, this is non-invasive brain function detection, right? So people doing some kind of functional task, we detect this using, you know, diffuse optics. However, near suffers a lot from, you know, physiological noise. There's a very, uh, you know, the spatial resolution wasn't that good. So, um, so at the end of this, I was like, you know, I really want to, you know, do something. I really want to work on some device which is, you know, very good, right? You know, you're very good in the spatial resolution very good not, you know, getting a lot of physiological noise. So that's why when I moved to McLean Hospital, I started to change my research to uh, MRI, right? So MRI is the best imaging technology you, have, you can ever had so far, right? You can, you know, I, I, I know many of you, you know, had MRI scan before. So at that time, actually, there was one big, you know, uh, focus of fMRI study, which is called the resting state fMRI. So basically what people do is we try to scan people while the people is not doing anything, it's called a resting state. So basically, we put people in the scanner, ask people not doing anything, not, not holding specific thoughts. We're going to scan you for 10 minutes. Then by studying these kind of networks, which happening still happening during your resting state, we can understand your brain function without you doing some kind of a task. So the problem, even today, the problem of the resting state after my study is that uh, there are a lot of physiological noise too, right? So for example, our brain, even though you're thinking you're resting, even you're sleeping, actually our brain is doing a huge amount of housekeeping work, regardless you want to do it now, right? The brain is working hard all the time. Actually, the most of the energy brain consume is the energy working on the house, you know, the, you know, the housekeeping function. 
So then these are called, we'll consider these as the physiological fluctuation of physiological noise. And how these physiological noise affect our resting state connectivity study is a big you know, question there. So my question uh, when I was in Mechanical Hospital was like, how can we tell you know, the signal we're detecting, how, how much uh, those signals are from physiological fluctuation, how much those signals are from neuronal you know, functional activity? Especially when people are not doing specific tasks. So actually the, the experiment we did together with Dr. Frederick was because I had a NEARS background, right? I, I did F NEARS all the time. So in this time, actually we conducted a very interesting concurrent study. So we break the NEARS you know, helmet, which would normally would detect brain activation you know, from the head. We break them apart. We make small NEARS probe to detect you know, your, your uh, blood oscillation at the peripheries. So these are the, we made these kind of NEARS probe. We detect, you know, physiological fluctuation at your periphery and the fingertip and toes while we scan the human using resting state, resting state you know, fMRI. So the, the idea was like, you know, nobody can argue with us that all the physiological fluctuation you detect at the finger toes, they are pure physiology, right? There's no neuronal contribution when the thing you detect at the finger toes. Then if we can see these physiological fluctuations in the brain, we can say, okay, these brain areas are affected by physiology, mostly compared to the other brain areas, right? So that's just a basic, very simple idea. So, you know, so we did this. Then this is the, I just jumped to the results. So you can see, you know, the, you know, I'm showing you the, the blue curve are the fluctuation we measure at the fingertip, and the red one are the, you know, fluctuation group fluctuation we measure using fMRI at the brain, certain brain voxels. Then you can see that for this image, you can see how many, how many brain voxels measured in fMRI study are contaminated by the signal we measure simultaneously from your finger. So that means the, this demonstrate that there is a huge amount of physiology that appear in your brain, right, during your resting state scans. So that leads to some, you know, uh, two you know, direction in my uh, research. One direction is to help people who's interested in resting state study to remove these noises by concurrently measuring your physiology from your fingertip and from your toe. And the second thing which actually I'm more interested in is that if you think about this kind of low frequency oscillation, they appear in your fingertip and toe and same time they appear in your brain, that means they must come from your heart lung system, right? Being pumped into different, these, these different regions. So maybe we can use this kind of low frequency oscillation as a biomarker, which can help us to track the blood flow. So that's exactly what we did, is we were able to, I hope this movie plays. So we were able to, using the low frequency oscillation, we recorded from your periphery, like your fingertip and your, and your toe, to use that as natural biomarkers to map the blood flow in your brain. So this is the blood flow using regular resting state fMRI study. However, we derive very you know, profound physiological fluctuations, and in this case, the blood flow in the brain. So, so these are the things I've ever been doing you know, since then. So I just say, you know, since physiology is so interesting, brain physiology is so interesting, so why don't I just change my research focus to brain physiology? So that's exactly what I did. So until today, my lab is still doing, is the, I think it's one of the few labs still, is doing, uh, you know, study brain physiology using fMRI. And I'm very fortunate when I come to, after I come to uh, Purdue, I have a lot of collaboration, right? You can see I'm doing, uh, right now I'm doing all these studies. I'm doing sleeping studies with Dr. Schwichenberg and uh, Vitaly Rice. And this, in this study, we try to understand the lymphatic system and try to understand how people, why, and how people sleep you know, and how that impacts your brain function, especially how that leads to Alzheimer's disease. And secondly, we're doing collaborate with many, you know, fantastic researchers from IU School of Medicine. We try to understand cerebral blood vessel, you know, health, right? So hypertension, all these things, how that can affect your, uh, your brain health. And we also do sickle cell studies, brain injury studies, and also dog studies with um, um, all these fantastic collaborators. And I really appreciate Purdue because, you know, after I come to Purdue, I acquire this many toys. Uh, you know, I have, a, you know, I have this kind of respiratory system. So now, not only we can detect low frequency oscillation, we can manipulate it by using mixed gas. So I can really give people different mixed gas and try to change their low frequency oscillation in their body and to track them better, right? I have near system and we developed, sorry, 
of a near system that I have a near system with the allow for the animal. I have a near system with the allow for the periphery only. And in addition, I acquired EEG uh, system we can use during the sleeping study, and we acquired ultrasound system we can understand blood flow directly. Right, so all these toys are, are fantastic, and you know, we try to use them to understand brain physiology better. So in addition to uh, research, um, for the past three years, I, um, I got opportunity to uh, teach uh, imaging class in uh, University of Rwanda um, every year. I spend a, a basic a month every year in University of Rwanda teaching imaging class. So these are my uh, students, and these are you know we organize tours to uh, inter you know to uh, uh, in, you know to see the local hospitals to understand the imaging device. So this is very interesting. So that you know I learned a lot from these experience. Uh, for example, the time I went there, and they asked me you know Dr. Tong. You know, um, you know, Rwanda will have the whole country have a two MRI machines. At, at that time, one was broken. So, do you have a cheaper things we can use? I said, I'm sorry. You know, we try to develop something, but right now I do not have a, a clear answer. So that's why I bring. I try to bring this message to our people, to our student. That you know, in US, because everything is so advanced. So if you want to do research or something, you're competing. You just you know try to solve like smaller problems because everybody is so advanced. So Many problems have been solved. However, if you go out of this country, if you go to Africa, right, so there's a huge amount of market, right, just anything, you can develop something which is, you know, scientifically is nothing new. However, if you can make nothing cheaper, your impact is huge. Your impact is, you know, is huge. So I just really try to bring this message to our BME students to try to encourage them to, to get out of this country, really, really go to the world and see the problems which they can make it a very, very great impact on, on people's life. So here I want to really thank many of my mentors. You know, most likely, I, you know, among them, I would like to thank Dr. Blaise Frederick. Right? Then that's our fun time. We always place all the device on ourselves and measure ourselves. <laughs> so this is not, you know, he's, he, we're doing this like, you know, all the time. I really like to thank uh, Tom Tlovich, who's the faculty uh, recruited me, and he gave me a fantastic device for the first few years. Uh, and later on, I like to thank Young King, Kinan Park, and Rishi, and they helped me and guided me throughout all these years, even today. And finally, I would like to thank my student. I tell my student, you know, I really, you know, the one thing Purdue, you know, really uh, changed my mind is the student. Like, I was working at Harvard Medical School. I couldn't get this good student over there. Right, so Purdue students are the top notch. I really appreciate their work, and they, they teach me as much as I, I try to teach them. So at the end of the day, I was uh, preparing this talk. I was thinking to myself, you know, um, really, am I that special? Am I really conquer all obstacles to reach this position? Actually, I don't think so, right? Because I didn't tell you my father is, was a nuclear physicist, right, engineer. My mother is MD doctor. So me being a biomedical engineering professor is predetermined, right? So it's sort of like determined. So, um, you know, as, as I, what I did is I just, you know, avoid several traps, right? But basically, I, I just a lucky guy, born, you know, in a very lucky family, and, uh, you know, just walk my predetermined path. So for the rest of my career, I would like to, you know, share my luck with the people, my student, and people living in different countries. Thank you. So Yunjie, congratulations again. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and a little bit of your journey um, you share with all of us here. Uh, so now we can open up to, uh, to questions. Thanks for your presentation, and I think also highlighting that it's not always an easy road, and I admittedly glossed over some of the <laughs> rougher parts of my own <laughs> um, PhD journey um, in my talk. Um, but um, I uh, was curious about the, the dog study that you had a bullet point about and uh, um, uh, what you might, or I don't know how far along that is, but if there's any new insights that you could share about what you've learned or who's, who's sponsoring that research. Yeah. Uh, I 
I forgot the, uh, yeah, I was uh, working with Dr. Ogata. Uh, Ogata is a uh, you know, um, professor here, and she, um, so basically that dog study is try to understand the impact of the having, owning a dog, uh, that impact on your, uh, on your stress, right, stress. So, uh, for example, in the study, we, you know, giving people different stress level while having them, you know, with the dog or not with the dog to see their stress. So, I forgot exactly where it was. It was funded by a, a foundation. Uh, I forgot the name. I cannot tell you right at this point. But you know, um, what was was the other question? Or um, I guess that was really that was just the one. I mean, I, yeah. I, I guess I was interested because you hear all the time that most people, you know, have pets because they're supposed to reduce yeah. stress. And so I was curious you know, to do kind of this more scientific research to, I guess, yeah. maybe show that more very specifically. I was curious if there was more yeah, to why you were digging that far, kind of deeper into that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, the, for, the, for pilot study, you know, this is a pilot study for the, I think, 20-some subject we collected. We did see uh, uh, some influence of having your dog. However, we couldn't tell having your own dog versus having, a, you know, other people's dog. But at this point, they all have positive effect on your emotion, on your, you know, uh, stress, uh, anti-stress effect. However, at this, we, we want to separate your own dog versus the other dog. I think at that point we cannot separate because our sample size is small. Okay, yeah, thank you. but they do have the effect. Just to, just to continue on the dog theme, um, <laughs> the um, CARES hub that will be opening in the um, Armstrong in the next uh, couple of weeks, we are hoping at some point to be able to have dog therapy days as well. Not to be determined on how that's going to work out, but we, we also recognize the importance of having our pets and our animals around us. Yeah, for. it's surprising to, to understand this very much, you know, even though there's so many people having pets, but the study, on, especially on the brain, you know, functional study is very, very you know, under-researched in this, in this area. Yeah. Um, again, just a follow-up question on the on the dog uh, study. Um, so when you, I'm I'm just curious. So when when you say with a dog they have a positive response or a positive emotion, like what are you seeing that lets you to believe that it's a positive emotion? I think right now is some kind of a, a brain network, right? So we can try to understand, you know, certain certain kind of network connectivity. So that strength of network connectivity activity is being strengthened during, you know, having a dog or during not having a dog. And we give, you know, we see how, we also measure their behavior. We ask them questions, we measure. So we see like how fast they, you know, come back from stress level. You know, we brought them to that, you know, how fast they come back with the dog versus without the dog. So those are measures, um, you know, we did. And in terms of these sort of uh, correlations between what they say and what you see, do you see some like constant patterns across people, or is it like individualized sort of? Uh, at, at this time, I think, you know, I haven't checked the individual data, but on the group data of over like 20 some subjects, we see a pretty positive effect as a group level. I do not know about individual, because I said at this time, 20 subjects, we couldn't even tell people the effect from the, your own dog versus the effect from, you know, neighbor's dogs, for example. But when you have a dog, when you're a dog loving person, having a dog, will already, you know, help you to some degree. But we, you know, we're, the, the study is still going on. We hopefully, hopefully we can give you more answers on this. Sense. Yeah. You said that um, you're doing the resting fMRI. Yeah. And you said that you, uh, people weren't supposed to be thinking about anything. How, how do you get people to not think about anything? <laughs> That's, that's a fantastic question, right? So, so yeah, let, let me say resting state from my, you know, you cannot not think of anything, right? So it really take a lot of effort to not think of anything. Um, but, the, but the thing is that, um, you know, in terms of the research, what we do is we try to ask people, say, please lie there, right? Just not specific whole of one particular thoughts, right? Just relax. Do whatever you do, just do not fall asleep. That's the instruction we give to, to the people, right? So, so that, that, that's the thing. And uh, in order for them to stay awake, generally speaking, we will project a cross line in front of them. So we try to let them see that. And uh, some fancy uh, um, you know, uh, 
uh, facility, they will have you know, monitored to the eye. So they will see the person while they are being scanned, they can monitor their eyes. If their eye closed for some reason, they can wake them up. But that's typical way to do it. But it's very hard to really, you know, not. So that's actually, that's the basic idea behind resting state because your brain is always, your, your network is always talking to each other even though you're in the resting state. So that's why we can study them even you are resting. You still planning, you still do all these things without you, you know, knowing that. So maybe that's the basic thing. We can study these networks while you're still in resting because you're still, you know, thinking about all these things. Any other questions? Um, I think, let's just do one more and then we need to wrap it up. It's um, good, there are a lot of questions too. I have one for colleague. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was really interested in what you said about the importance of making existing technology more accessible and cost effective cost efficient. Where do you see those efforts coming from in the future? Is that something that can be achievable from an academic research perspective? Do you need a corporate sponsor for that kind of work? Or I guess, where do you envision that coming from? I think my vision is, first, first of all, I think our students need to step out of this country, right? So we're living in the bubble, right? I, to be honest with you, like, you know, I, you know, I come here, I love this country. But on the other side, I, I, I really feel fortunate to be born in China at that time, which wasn't a very rich country. You know? so, uh, so the thing is, I really would like our students to step out of this country, number one, to see the need of the world, right? So see 95% you know, of people, their condition and their needs. And, and then you know, to identify some problems. And I, as I said, you know, identify problems and solve problems uh, uh, is the second level, but first, number one thing is to see see the problem, right? And, uh, and and the market is huge. I just you know when I when you go there, you know I, as Rwanda, I don't know if you understand Rwanda. Rwanda has a genocide, you know. I think you know in the in the nineties it was very bad, but the, the the country just recovered unbelievable. Like the that just you know you just can see people making daily effort to make their country better and better. You know, I can see that. So, um, and there's, you know, the country is stable. They have a lot of uh, investment in terms of biomedical engineering, in terms of all kinds of engineering. So there's a huge market there. So I, you know, I, I just think we need to identify a problem working with the local government. They have a lot of need. Then, you know, you know just uh, open our eyes. That's, that's the thing I want to do. Yeah. It's a wonderful way to end your presentation. And thank you, Yunjie. And we really appreciate all the questions to him. And I want to um, give you a round of applause. <laughs> because I'm the moderator of the last presentation, also get the chance to uh, say thank you to all the three speakers. And another round of applause. And, <laughs> and I'm told to give the mic to Marsha. I am Marsha Freeland, the Director of Faculty Success Programs here. On behalf of Dr. Dean Rahman and Associate Dean Liu, thank you very much for coming today. This concludes our uh, celebrations for this academic year, but uh, fear not, uh, the Board of Trustees will be ratifying our next batch on uh, um, April 4th and 5th, so we're going to have some very interesting talks next year and celebrate their journeys as well. And thank you for sharing your journeys. So with that, have a great day.